Good morning, church. It's, it's so wonderful to come together and worship the Lord together. And uh, you all know that the last two uh, sermons I spoke were about uh, the sacrifice of Isaac, how Abraham sacrificed uh, uh, Isaac, and I promise this is going to be the last in this season. <laughs> and uh, last time we have seen if uh, is it God who uh, asked our demand for the human sacrifice and uh, and we also have seen uh, that it is not God who demands human sacrifice and Abraham's uh, story, I, Abraham sacrificing Isaac is a story through which God loudly spoke to the entire world and said that he doesn't seek human sacrifice. And then if he doesn't seek human sacrifice, why did he ask his son to be sacrificed, who is a human? And that also uh, we have uh, discussed, we, we meditated on that and we learned that it was not that God who was after human sacrifices, but it was humans who were after human sacrifices. Without them they were not satisfied. And of course a lot of the things we studied, uh, I'm not going into all of them in case if you want to check those messages, uh, they will be available on YouTube. Uh, today, I'm going to speak about the same incident where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. I titled it as the God test. I purposefully chose this word so that it may not uh, clearly tell whether it was God who was tested or it was Abraham who was tested. Okay, that's how I was uh, looking at uh, this story. However, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going into making some conclusions uh, about those things, but I would like to do another thing. We all know very well there are a lot of incidents in the Old Testament. They were shadows to what Jesus has done in the New Testament. A lot of incidents in the Old Testament that are reflecting the reality that has been revealed in Jesus Christ. And... Some of them are very clearly written in the scripture and some of them are given uh, only some glimpse of it but not full uh, understanding of those uh, shadows and realities, uh, especially when we read the Old Testament. In order to understand, sometimes we can take the writings which are written during the time of Old Testament. We can call them as uh, paracanonical books. There are books uh, that... Uh, speak and fill, uh, fill in some details of uh, these incidents and these stories. And there was a uh, scholar named David Yevot. He mentions that in the Greek uh, New Testament, there are 132 passages or quotes which are not directly taken from Old Testament, but they are made, they are, um, uh, made uh, like, you know, some... Inferences were made based on some paracanonical books. There are some other books which are written in those times only from which uh, they have made some quotes and all. Like for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 which is known, known, well known to all of us. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Right? We all use it very much but it is actually taken from paracanonical books. And we all know another statement, a very well-known statement from Apostle Paul, which is in Acts 17, 28 uh, and 29, where he says, For in him we live, move, and have our being, as also some of uh, your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. This, is, uh, this word was taken from Greek poetry. And another other thing, one, uh, one of the important things I would like to say, show you, which is not directly from the Old Testament, but from paracanonical books, uh, that is Luke chapter 24, verse 46, where Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead the third day. It's a very important for prophecy, right? But this is also not directly taken from the Old Testament, but some from some uh, paracanonical books. So what am I going to do is, today I'm going to make use of a paracanonical book which I have mentioned to you previously, uh, which is uh, 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 Safar ha Haggad. Uh, this is Legends from the Talmud and uh, uh, Midrash. These are the Hebrew literature, Hebrew people of uh, Old Testament times. They have some 
opinions and stories. Okay. Uh, so that I don't mean to make any dogmatical statements from those books. I'm not saying those are uh, inspired by God. Just because they have Bible refer Bible refers to them, that does not mean the book was inspired by God. And we have to read and believe everything in that. But there are certain comments they have made which go along with the main teachings of the New Testament. Those are the things I would like to focus. We have to judge them based on the New Testament teachings and the gospel and the God revealed in Jesus Christ. These are only thoughts and explanations of the people of biblical times. So what am I going to do uh, today? I am not going to draw any conclusions and I am not going to bring any applications from this story for life. Okay? But what am I going to do is I am going to reread the story from Genesis chapter 22 with the help of uh, Safar HaHagad, which is uh, the ancient, one of the ancient Jewish writings. So with that help, I would like to reconstruct or look at this story. We have already uh, seen the story. So whatever bits and pieces which are missing, so I wanted to bring them and collect them so that we, we can have a better picture, just as Heber Tikas men mentioned. It is the lens that helps us to look at a reality in an entirely new perspective in a new way. As I said again, I'm not making dogmatic statements from these paracanonical books, just taking the help of them, that's all. We all know the story, so I'm not going to narrate from the beginning till the end, but there are some incidents I'm going to bring to your notice through which we can look at the richness of this story. And also I would like to uh, beg your permission if I had to take a maximum of five minutes of extra time, okay? Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. We read this very easily. Then God said to, God called Abraham. Abraham said, here I am. And God said to Abraham, take now your son. Take now your son, your only son, Isaac. This is what written in the scripture. But if you read these books, there is a conversation that was missing. Did Abraham have only one son? Abraham had many sons, not just one son. He had a conversation with God which was recorded uh, in, uh, in the same book and there it is written, first it was a conversation between God and Abraham. God said, take now your son. Then Abraham asked, I have two sons, which one do you mean? God said, thine only son. Abraham said, both are only sons. Isaac is the only son I have from his mother. And Ishmael is the only son I have from her, uh, who is his mother. Then God said, the son whom you lovest. Then Abraham said, master of the universe, there are separate compartments in one's inmost self for love. I love both of them. Abraham again said, uh, that's what God, Abraham told God. And if you read the story again, Abraham says, when you commanded me to sacrifice Isaac, I should have replied, Yesterday you told me, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So, here comes, there was a conversation between God and Abraham regarding the one son. We don't find this in the scripture, but this helps us to understand what this only son means. The only son means, if you read the entire story, we understand the only son means the unique son. Isaac is a unique son from Ishmael. Ishmael also was born to Abraham in the old age only. Now, Abraham was not in his sweet 16s or 20s when Ishmael was born. He was also born at old age. Isaac also was born at old age. What is the uniqueness of Isaac? The uniqueness of Isaac is, Isaac is the son of the promise and he is the son of the covenant. Having that in mind, let us look at this word, John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Who is this only begotten son? If we read book of Luke chapter uh, 3 that ends with saying like Abraham, sorry, Adam, the son of God, according to that all of us are the children of God. But there is one uniqueness for Jesus Christ. And in the New Testament, in Matthew, it is, sorry, in Isaiah, it is written for, us, for unto us, a child was born, a son was given. 
the son is so unique what is the uniqueness of this son he is the eternal son of god and he is the son who was promised and he is the son through whom the new covenant was made so isaac when god and abraham were having this conversation we can understand this if only son god was referring to abraham was the son to whom the promises were made the son who was promised and the son through whom the covenant was made and that is a picture of jesus christ that we can see in the verse 1 having said that let us move to other incidents in genesis 22 verse 2 there uh, god said to him take now your son your only son isaac whom you love and go to the land of moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which i shall tell you most of the times we read this word as god told abraham to take isaac and sacrifice him on the mount moriah did abraham sacrifice isaac on mount moriah no where did abraham sacrifice mount <coughs> isaac on one of the mountains we have god said take them take isaac to one of those mountains right some people said mount mount moriah is the place where jesus was sacrificed but in reality it is not where what is the significance of mount moriah the significance we can find in second chronicles chapter 3 verse 1 now solomon began to build the house of the lord at jerusalem on mount moriah where the lord had appeared to his father david so solomon built the temple on mount moriah right it was not abraham did not sacrifice his son on mount moriah solomon built the temple on mount moriah was jesus crucified on mount moriah no because temple was already there how can he be crucified where was he crucified he was crucified on golgotha very good mount moriah is the place where the temple was built and jesus was the was in the place he was crucified where i mean it's called mount golgotha now having that in mind let us read this genesis chapter 22 verse 4 these people came near the mount uh, the location then the third day abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off if mount moriah is uh, uh something uh, where he is going to uh, sacrifice he came to mount moriah what is he looking at to understand that we need to read this it is written and saw the place from far off in genesis 22 verse 4 we see but since the place was hollowed out which means this is a place which is very small it was dug up and there is not much in the in this place how could it have been seen from far so abraham offered a sacrifice to god isaac on a small kind of mountain so it's not on a big mountain on a small mountain he offered but when the holy one decided to cause his presence uh, sorry this mountain is very small but why god chose this place and why the authors wrote it as a big mountain kind of thing the explanation is given but when the holy one decided to cause his presence to dwell there to make it his sanctuary he said it is not fitting for a king to dwell in a valley but only on a high and lofty mountain uh, resplendent Uh, in beauty and visible to all so he beckoned the valleys uh, environs to come together and provide a suitable place for the presence basically because god has chosen it has been elevated by the authors what am i trying to say from this very simple point isaac was offered on a small mountain not on the mount moriah jesus was not offered on mount moriah but on a small place which was hollowed out which is golgotha what is the meaning of the word golgotha skull hollowed out means <laughs> made a hole to the hill right skull so abraham and jesus sorry isaac and jesus both were offered on mount moriah what do we learn from this we learn about the worship 
The first time the word worship used in the entire Bible was in Genesis chapter 22 verse 5. Where it said, I and the lad will go yonder worship and come back. First worship ever took place not on Sinai mountain, not on Mount Moriah, not even in Jewish temple. The first true worship, it took place on Mount Golgotha. When Jesus offered himself as sacrifice, the true worship has been taken place. That is what it symbolizes from the story of Isaac. It tells that the true worship happened on the cross, but not in the temple through the sacrifices. And what is another implication? We are saved by the sacrifice of Jesus, not by the sacrifices of sacrificial system. We are not saved by temple. It, rep it is representing the sacrificial system, the killing of bulls and goats and what not. But we are not saved by any of those systems. We are not saved by Jewish religion. We are not saved by any of such. But we are saved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is what it is reflecting. Having said that, let us move to the next thing. That is Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. Abraham said to him, I left a word the third day. I will come back to it at the end. Okay. Uh, Genesis 22 verse 5 it is written and Abraham said to his young man stay here with the donkey the lad and I, I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you so we feel like this is just Abraham said okay we found the place you stay here we'll go back we'll go worship and come back let us see what it is in the ancient scripture same thing the filling ups okay then Abraham Isaac Isaac and Abraham they went there and Abraham asked Isaac do you see what I see and Isaac replied, I see a mountain radiant in majesty with a mysterious cloud hovering over it. This is what Isaac and Abraham, they were watching when they come to the area of Mount Moriah. And Abraham asked the two people, two lads, do you see anything? And they replied, we see nothing other than stretches of wilderness. Abraham and Isaac only could see the glory of God over on the mountain. And uh, uh, Abraham said to the people, O people like of asses, as the ass sees but does not comprehend, so it is with you. Abide ye here, people like the ass. <laughs> this is what Abraham told these people, Abraham and Isaac could see the glory of God revealed on this small mountain. The crowd reveals the glory of God, right? We, we all know the incidents in the Old Testament. When God came down to Sinai, what happened? A cloud came down on Sinai mountain where God and Moses had conversations. When God came down, came to temple, what happened? So tabernacle, the cloud came down. The cloud was representing the glory of God, the presence of God and the <coughs> glory of God. Whenever cloud came down, we came to realize that there is God. Whenever cloud came down, we realized God's glory was there. <coughs> God met people on Sinai mountain through cloud. And he met on Moriah through cloud. And on Golgotha through cloud. Right? Golgotha, where, where Abraham and Isaac were there, they have seen the cloud, they have seen the glory of God. And where else we can see the glory of God? And Golgotha again, when Christ came down, Christ brought the presence of God there. Christ brought the glory of God over there. And God met humanity at the cross. As he met humanity on Sinai mountain. And as he met at this small mountain where Abraham and Isaac have come. Can you see the connections? The beautiful things. Why am I saying this is uh, the cross is the glory of God? Uh, I mean, on, we, uh, on this mountain we can see the glory of God and the presence of God. Because Jesus himself mentioned in John chapter 17 verse 5, it was before his crucifixion. He was praying and he prayed. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the foundation of the world. And he has glorify me. He is going to be killed. He is going to be kicked. And he is going to be spat. His, uh, people are going to spit on him. 
And is it the glory we talk about? But Jesus was looking the cross as glory. That's why he's asking to the Father, Father, glorify me with the glory I have from the foundation of the world. Abraham and Isaac could see that glory on the mountain. Are we able to see the glory of God on the Mount Golgotha? Are we able to see the presence and gl glory of God in the cross of Jesus Christ? Or we are like the two lads. And Abraham knows whatever he called. The glory of God revealed in the cross of Jesus Christ. The same thing it was picturizing. Having said that, let's move. Genesis chapter 22 verse 6. So Abraham took the wood and burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. So... <coughs> This is what um, it is written in the scripture. And let, uh, let us add some details to it. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son as upon condemned who is made to carry the cross upon his shoulder. This is not something written after Jesus' crucifixion. This is written way beyond. Uh, it was written during the Old Testament times. It was these were oral traditions during the time of Moses and all. It, they they could see that when Abraham taken Isaac, and his Isaac was carrying the wood, he's saying he was carrying as if he is carrying the cross. That's why John saw Jesus uh, uh, the other day, and he said in John one thirty six. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He could see the connections. <laughs> he could see Jesus as the Lamb that, who was taking away the sin of the world, just as Isaac was carrying the wood. Having said that, uh, Genesis 22 verse 9, They came to the place of which God had told them. We read it very simple. But let's read it with some details there. Here it is written. And they came to the place. I put it in red marks. Please give attention to that. I came to the place both carrying... Sorry, they came to the place both carrying stones for the altar, both carrying the fire, both ca uh, carrying the wood. For all that Abraham acted like... One making wedding preparations for his son and Isaac like one making a wedding bow for himself. Who walked? Who was carrying? Was it Isaac alone? No, it was Abraham also who was carrying the stones and who was carrying the wood along with Isaac. Many a times we read uh, Psalm 22, verse uh, two, 1 and 2, it is written, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we think that God the Father has forsaken Jesus because the sin of the world was upon Jesus. But Father did not abandon Jesus while he was on the cross, but he was in Jesus and with him on the cross so that they may reconcile the world together. That's what Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Where was Christ? God while Jesus was carrying the cross? He was in Christ. He was with Christ. He did not abandon him. And that's why, boy, here he says in John 17, verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify me. This is the word we, came previ we read previously. Glorify me together with yourself and God the Father and the Son both have considered the cross as a glory and both of them they went and glorified and with the glory which I had with you before the beginnings of the world that's what it, Jesus prayed God the Father and Son both have taken up our pain suffering and the cross and both of them raised us up from the dead and reconciled us and um, both of them revealed their glory on the cross. The triune God involved and were together as Jesus suffered and they considered as glorifying like wedding. Can you see the connections? And very few more are there and I will close. Uh, in Genesis chapter 22 verse 9 And Abraham built an altar there 
uh, altar there and placed the wood in order and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. We all know what happened later, right? But what was happening in there, let's see. Then Isaac said, Father, hurry, do the will of your maker, burn me into fine ash, Isaac. Nevertheless, I shall not deviate from the will of the, my maker and from the biding of my father. Isaac knew that he was going to be sacrificed even before they climbed the mountain. Still, he volunteers himself his life. He voluntarily gave himself to be sacrificed. And John chapter 10, verse 17 to 18, it says, Therefore, my father loves me because I, lie, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. Father gave the command and he voluntarily giving his life. And father gave the command to Isaac, Abraham, and he voluntarily gave himself to the father's hand. This is the only unique son who was reflecting the glory of the only true eternal son of God. So, we all know what happened later. Abraham was about to sacrifice. And there is another thing happened as Abraham was going to sacrifice. When Abraham was about to begin the sacrifice, Isaac said, Father, bind my hands and my feet for the urge to live is so willful that when I see the knife coming at me, I may flinch involuntarily, causing the knife to cut improperly and thus disqualify myself as an offering. So I beg you, Bind me in such a way that no blemish will befall me. So Abraham bound his son well. Look what Abraham was saying. So Isaac was telling him, Father, I may get scared and run away. You tie me well. And so that your knife may cut me properly. So I may not escape. If knife did not cut me properly, I will become blemish. I should be a blameless sacrifice unto the Lord. Look at the honor he has for the Lord. And do the will of God. He is praying. And let me read this verse to you. Luke chapter 22 verse 42 says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, nevertheless, not my will. Let thy will be done. This is what Jesus prayed. Isn't it same thing Isaac prayed? Am I making any sense? <laughs> knowing his sufferings, Jesus, knowing his sufferings, Jesus surrendered himself into the hands of the Father, just as Isaac, knowing that he is going to be killed, he offered himself, he gave himself into the hands of the Father and prayed to the Father, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit and he'll breathe his last. This is what the story of Isaac is about. It is revealing. So, having said that, I'll run through this uh, small uh, slide which we discussed previously. Does God seek human sacrifice? Genesis 22, verse 7 to 8, we, see, we can see Isaac said, Look, the fire and the blood, oh, sorry, fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Does God seek human sacrifice? No. Abraham knows. It's not God who seeks uh, sacrifice. That's why he said no. It was not God who required sacrifice, nor the human, not, not the human sacrifice. But on the other hand, it was humans who required sacrifice to receive forgiveness. That is the reason God said, the Lord will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. He is going to give sacrifice to the Lord. And yet he said, it is not God who seeks for sacrifice. It is God who gives the sacrifice. He is not the God who seeks blood. He is the God who gives his own blood for our own sake, for our salvation. That's why Abraham said, God, he gives sacrifice, but he doesn't go, uh, take. God is someone who provides sacrifice, not 
uh, the one who seeks sacrifice. The day God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, he already sacrificed his son. The moment when he came and asked Abraham to sacrifice, in his heart, he already sacrificed his own son. He knows Abraham is, I'm not going to take the child of Abraham, but on his behalf, I'm going to give my child. And he knows the day he asked him. So if God already offered the sacrifice on the day one, what is this story conveying? Right? I said, the day he asked itself, God already given. In that case, why this entire story? Not necessary, right? It happened. To understand this, we need to go back to the word I missed. Um, Genesis chapter 22, verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Okay, and with, uh, with some clarity it is like this. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw, why on the third day, sorry, why not on the first or on the second, that the nations of the world might not say, God deranged Abraham so that he cut his son's throat. He wants, he, these things are written. There are, Abraham saw on the third day the mountain and they were going to offer the sacrifice. Why, if God wanted the sacrifice of Isaac, the same day it can be done, right? So, his, he may, before Abraham changed his mind, before he go through the two days of trauma, he can easily offer sacrifice. But why he didn't do that? But he made him to delay for three days. And these authors, they say, God delayed it for three days so that people may not think that God made him fool to kill his son. In other words, God doesn't want to kill the son of Isaac. If he killed the day one, and people say God made Abraham mad, that's why he sacrificed. But he wanted to prove he is not. He did not make Isaac, sorry, Abraham mad. Why? Because the third day is the day of resurrection, not the day of death. Can you relate? Third day is not the day of death. Third day is the day of resurrection. Jesus died on which day he rose again from the dead? The third day he rose again from the dead. That's why Abraham was believing God will be able to raise my son even from the ashes. That's what author of Hebrews says. Because the third day is not the day of death. Third day is the day of resurrection. So God offered the sacrifice on the day he asked Abraham for sacrifice for the matter of fact, even from the foundation of the world. Even before the foundation of the world itself, he offered his sacrifice. Why am I saying that? Because it is written in the scripture again. Genesis 22 verse 13. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by, the horn, by its horns so Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. But let's see what these ancient people were reading, what happened there. Uh, one more point with that I will close. Eliezer said, the ram came from, uh, Abraham asked from where did this ram come? He just found suddenly ram was there. Okay? And he offered the sacrifice. Before that he asked from where did this ram came? Eliezer said, the ram came from the mountains. Where he had been grazing, any, any uh, ram comes from grazing, it won't. From green pastures, nothing will come to wilderness, but this came. Okay? An angel brought him from the Garden of Eden, where he had been grazing beneath the tree of life and drinking out of the waters that passed under it, and the fragrance of the ram went forth throughout the world. When was the ram placed in the garden? During the twilight at the end of the six days of creation. Now you read these words. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8. The lamb was slain from the foundations of the world. And this is the same ram these people are talking about. When did God I offered his sacrifice instead of Isaac? That is even before the foundations of the world. God offered forgiveness to children of Israel, Isaac, remembering Abraham's sacrifice and forgiveness to the entire world through 
Jesus. The same story, if you read more, my time is over, so I have to complete. There are a lot more things to be uh, noticed. Uh, they, right after this, the conversation goes. Abraham, God stops Abraham from sacrificing. And Abraham asks, <laughs> God, when you asked me to sacrifice that day itself, I should have spoken to you. But I did not. I controlled my impulses. And I came till here and to obey your commandment. Now I, now I tell you, you have to listen to me. And he says, I did not withheld my son from offering to you. So you have to withheld my son from any sin. Whenever my son and the children of my son for all generations, if they commit sin, you have to forgive them. This is the demand Abraham made. You have to forgive the children, my son and my, the children of my son forever. <coughs> the remembering what I have done now. And God says, yes, but your children are going to do sin over and over again. And they are going through trauma. But one day is coming in which I am going to send my son. And I'm going to forgive them forever. If you want to read this story, I, as I shared the same book, I'll share it with you even in, in the WhatsApp, whoever wants personally, I'll share it with you. Go through this story. So through sacrifice of Isaac, Abraham bought the forgiveness of, uh, Abraham bought the forgiveness of entire children of Isaac through the sacrifice of Jesus. God bought the forgiveness of entire world forever. That is what this story sounds if you read it with the ancient commentators along with them. But I wonder this thing. When these people had such a deep grasp and they are able to see this story, why were they not able to understand Jesus? I was just wondering, imagine Paul knowing this story, all this, and he was reading Genesis chapter 22. What happens? This is what might have happened. And that's why he wrote the epistles and the gospels. So apostles and the early Jewish Christians read these stories in the light of God revealed in Jesus Christ. That's why we got our New Testament and the gospels and epistles, whatever we said. So they interpreted and connecting it to Jesus. So Jesus is the object behind the shadow. Uh, sorry, Jesus is, not, uh, Jesus is not just the object behind the shadow. Sorry for the typing error. But he is the light and the lens that creates the shadow and that reveals the reality. So, this is my prayer and my desire that all of us may be able to see the rich shadows and rich scripture that God has blessed us in the light of the God revealed in Jesus Christ. May God bless you.